Milius, I'm chair of Alaska Common Ground. I want to welcome you to tonight's discussion of the land use and transportation sector of the Anchorage Climate Action Plan, exploring local solutions to our climate crisis. And on this beautiful sunny day, or I guess now moonlit evening, we would like to acknowledge the original inhabitants of this area, the Denina people, the land that Anchorage is situated on is the traditional land of the Denino. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the Denino people past, present, and future. We will have two more Zoom events coming up, um, delving into the Municipalities Climate Action Plan, all on Thursday evening from seven o'clock to 8.30. On Thursday, March 25th, we'll be talking about food systems and on Thursday, April 29th, consumption and solid waste. You can register and find more information about these events on our website, where you can also find a recording of our first event discussing buildings and energy from last month. And we will put the link in the chat and we hope you can join us for these events. We'd like to thank our sponsors for this series, the Alaska Center, Solid Waste Services, Cook Inlet Keeper and Renewable Independent Power Producers, more commonly referred to as Renewable IPP. We'd also like to thank our partners, the Renewable Energy Alaska Project, better known as REAP, the Anchorage Public Library, the League of Women Voters of Anchorage, and the UAA APU Books of the Year. We could not conduct the work we do without the support of our members and our donors. And normally we hold these events in person and ask people to donate at the door. Since we can't do that, we encourage you to support events like this by becoming a member or making a donation online at alaskacommonground.org. We'll put a link in the chat. You can also remember us when you file for your PFD and do your pick, click, give. A few housekeeping items. Um, Everyone's audio has been muted this evening except for the presenters. The event is being recorded in case you and your friends would like to watch it and listen to it at a later date. He's shuffling his papers. Um, if you want to ask questions or provide feedback during the event, we are taking those to the Zoom's chat feature at the bottom of your screen. We'll collect your questions and the moderator will ask them after the panelist presentations. The event will run until 8.30 p.m. Tonight's moderator is Pierce Schwalb. Pierce is the Sustainability Coordinator at the Anchorage Department of Solid Waste Services, where he works to extend the life of the Anchorage landfill, reduce emissions from utility operations, and support the implementation of the Anchorage Climate Action Plan. He has worked to promote sustainable transportation, planning for and managing a network of electric vehicle charging stations, and hydrogen fueling stations in Northern California and advocating for better biking and walking facilities with Bike Anchorage, a group committed to making Anchorage a great place to bike and walk. Now I will turn the program over to Pierce. Great, thanks so much for that introduction. I'm happy to be here. Uh, before we get started, just wanted to thank Alaska Common Ground for hosting this series and to all of our panelists. Uh, we are very fortunate to have uh, such industry experts on the call tonight. I think first up is answers to our poll. Um, if you do not see the poll box on your screen, click on the green words uh, poll in process to bring that up. And so I'm going to go ahead and click on that myself. So we have some results coming in. Um, the question was, have you purchased A? And the options were electric vehicle, hybrid vehicle, electric bike, considering purchasing one of the above or no. Um, looks like a ton of folks are considering purchasing, which is great, up to about 45% of respondents. Um, that's about tied with no. So I'd say 50% is pretty darn good. 10% uh, with an electric vehicle. So this is a uh, pretty progressive crowd. That's great. 8% uh, with hybrid and 3% with an electric bike. Fantastic. Thanks for taking that poll. I think we got just about everybody participated. I've got 
Great, polls closed, fantastic. Okay, so we can go ahead and dive into the presentation. Tonight, you're gonna to be hearing from Sean Scaling, who is the manager of business and sustainable program development at Chugach Electric Association. Michelle McNulty, who is the director of the planning department for the municipality of Anchorage. Joni Welm, who is a senior transportation planner and the bicycle and pedestrian coordinator for the municipality of Anchorage. And finally, Bart Rudolph, who is the transit planning manager for the municipality of Anchorage. Just some quick housekeeping, just like Dick said, please put your questions in the chat and I'll ask them of panelists at the end. So I think we're ready to get started with my presentation. If that's okay, I will go ahead and share my screen. Okay, can you see that okay? Yes. Yeah. Great, thanks so much. So for my presentation this evening, I'll provide a quick overview of the structure of Anchorage's Climate Action Plan, the goal areas identified for each of the different sectors, and a short discussion on tracking progress toward those goals. So the municipality adopted the Climate Action Plan in May of 2019, and in keeping with a transportation theme, the plan serves as a roadmap to both reduce emissions and adapt to our changing climate. It was produced through a partnership between the Muni and University of Alaska Anchorage. It took about a year to develop and relied on input from about 1300 Anchorage residents. The Climate Action Plan is broken down into seven sectors, representatives from University of Alaska, Alaska Pacific University, the Muni, state and federal employees, uh, nonprofit representatives, they all created actions and recommendations within each of these different sectors. So unsurprisingly, transportation makes up a big chunk of our emissions. In fact, Alaska is the number one state in the country for transportation emissions per capita. This is due in large part to our land size, relatively small population, and geographic isolation. The solution for lowering emissions from the sector are pretty clear. Use less gasoline and diesel fuel. So to accomplish that, we have a couple goal areas. The first one is promote land use planning that minimizes the distance folks have to travel by car. Michelle McNulty is going to speak in more depth about this, but such projects as adding additional housing downtown, mixed use development in Spinard that's gone up. Those kind of things move us closer to this goal. Our second goal area is increasing use of public transit and non-motorized transportation. Joni Wilm and Bart Rudolph are gonna be covering this in depth, but I wanted to share a few exciting developments. Things like the new fat bike racks on people mover buses and extension of non-motorized facilities on Spinard Road. And finally, promoting the use of energy efficient vehicles. Sean Scaling is gonna dive into this one, but a few highlights here include a recently passed ordinance requiring new one in two family homes to include a rough-in for electric vehicle charging stations. There's a picture here too of a public charging station installed at the Rustic Goat. This was put in through a partnership between the municipality and Chugach Electric. And then the one on the right is a picture of Solid Waste Services fully electric Chevy Bolt. Another project I wanted to share related to promoting the use of energy efficient vehicles is one that I'm really excited about here at Solid Waste Services we're gonna be launching a heavy duty electric vehicle pilot. So thanks to a partnership with the Department of Energy, the Alaska Energy Authority and the University of Alaska, we're gonna be receiving a fully electric box truck used for cart deliveries in April and then two fully electric uh, class eight refuse trucks that will be used for residential garbage and recycling collection We'll get those at the end of the year in 2021. 
and then we'll be charging them using the state of the art battery tied direct current fast charging station at the transfer station. So something really interesting, there's gonna be a lot of data coming out of this thanks to the University of Alaska partnership and the Alaska Center for Energy and Power. Gonna be collecting performance data on charging and how the trucks perform to be able to share that with fleets here in the state and nationwide, um, mostly for cold weather performance, but just looking at electrification uh, in a heavy duty fleet. So a lot of novel data and analysis coming out of that one. As a big goal, so this is our new transfer station facility. It's a mock-up that's going across the street from the current one. We are in the process of planning for a fully electric refuse fleet. So in the process of constructing, we are running conduit to support charging stations at e each one of the vehicle bays in anticipation of expanding that electric fleet in the future. So how do we track all of this stuff? How do we prove that the actions we're taking are actually getting us closer to reducing emissions. In 2017, the municipality completed a greenhouse gas inventory for the year of 2015. And in that inventory, it was estimated that there were about 3.6 billion vehicle miles traveled in Anchorage with about 1.7 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent. However, these estimates were obtained from state level data and they're not ideal for tracking our progress through these goal areas because what we're doing here in the municipality is pretty local. Fortunately, future inventories will have the advantage of superior data. AMATS is in the process of updating their travel model to include vehicle, mile, vehicle miles traveled estimates. This will allow us to model how land use changes reduce overall vehicle miles traveled. Also out as of March, 2018, we have a local fuel sales tax that will give us some really good local data about fuel consumption. So we can start to look at how improvements like converting to an electric fleet reduce fuel consumption. So we, have to, we should have some really good data going forward to start tracking progress toward this um, emissions reduction. And finally, I wanted to end my presentation with some individual actions you can take to really um, impact this. Things like walk, bike, or take the bus, even if that's just once a week, uh, the more bikes people see, the safer it is for everyone on the road, all road users. Also, being a bike, walk, and bus friendly driver. They say that regular pedestrians and cyclists are much better drivers, it's definitely true. Just be on the lookout for all road users at all times. Also would recommend supporting community nonprofits like Bike Anchorage and the Alaska Electric Vehicle Association. They're working to improve sustainable transportation here in Anchorage. Also participate in the creation of transportation plans like the city's new non-motorized plan. Joni Wilm is gonna speak to this in detail a little bit later. And finally, participate in your community council. Every year, councils submit an annual survey of their priority projects. So this is the council's opportunity to say, in our neighborhood, this is what we really believe is gonna improve things for us. Okay, that's all for me. Um, I will head back here. And I will stop the share. And then we're going to go to um, Sean Scaling next, but let me make sure that that's good to go. Okay, great. So I think I've stopped sharing, so we should be able to move on to Sean just a minute. So we're going to be hearing from Sean Scaling next. Sean Scaling manages business and sustainable program development at Chugach Electric Association, a position that includes supporting the expansion of electric vehicles, beneficial electrification, and other grid development activities that meet the cooperative utilities sustainability business management philosophy. Okay, I will hand it over to you, Sean. Looks like we have a poll up for him. All right, thanks. Yeah, we started with a poll here. This is uh, getting at what are your main barriers for driving electric? Um, and it's actually stated in two different ways. Uh, one is mark them all, but I'm also interested in what is the primary um, barrier to driving electric? So. 
The poll is open. If you could go ahead and mark your, your barriers and then your main barrier, that would be great. In the meantime, I'll get started and we'll come right back to that when the results are in in just a minute. Um, so anyway, it's great to see everybody uh, on screen here. I wish we were all in person, but I see a lot of familiar names and, um, and it's really fun to be talking about electric vehicles here tonight. Um, I'm, I'm gonna be talking relatively quickly about um, particularly electric vehicles and greenhouse gas or CO2 emissions. Um, I'll touch upon a couple of other things and I'm gonna try to uh, move quickly through it so that we have lots of time for questions. Um, and I encourage you to put things in the chat if you have questions to come up later. I understand we'll be able to address uh, some or all of those. Let's see how these results are looking. So on the, uh, maybe I need to make my screen a little bigger to see the second question, but it looks like lack of charging stations is a leader. Upfront cost is a leader. It looks like it's pretty spread out throughout. Um, let's see, maybe just five more seconds on the poll and then we'll close. And I'll take a look at that a little bit better. All right, and I'm gonna wrap it up in two, one, great. So it looks like uh, lack of charging stations and upfront costs are a couple of the leaders in the overall. Let me scroll down to see the primary barrier upfront cost. Okay, that's understandable, but it really is all across the board. That's not too surprising. Uh, as far as the lack of charging stations go, um, uh, Chugach Electric, of course, we're really supportive of electric vehicles and we'll talk about it more. There are some things we can do and some things we can't do. Uh, we're, of course, the electric utility and so anything related to, to charging, we're very interested in and we are doing things and can help in that regard. As far as having more electric vehicles in town and lowering the cost of them, I can tell you a little bit more about that. Uh, probably not something we'll be too directly involved in, although you'll be surprised maybe uh, how we're tangentially involved. Let me go ahead and share my screen now. Um, I've, sorry, I'm not seeing my button right now. Just one second. There it is. Share screen. And that one. And let me get that into presentation mode. Okay, Pierce, can you give me a thumbs up if you're seeing that correctly? Looks good, thanks, Sean. All right. So as I said before, I'm gonna talk mostly about greenhouse gas or carbon dioxide. Internal combustion engines noted here as ICE, internal combustion engine, uh, typically, uh, uh, assuming uh, 10,000 miles per year, we'll have about 9,300 pounds of CO2 per year. And that's coming out of the tailpipe, of course. A battery electric vehicle, or noted here as BEV, uh, and which is all electric, has about 2,600 pounds of CO2, an incredibly smaller amount. And of course, it doesn't have a tailpipe, but it does have emissions, and that's coming from the power plant. You can see the picture there has the uh, Chugach South, South, South Central Power Project uh, behind our electric vehicle, just to show there, there is kind of a tailpipe still, but the emissions are amazingly reduced, 72% uh, CO2 reduction. So we do think that electric vehicles will be a part of the greenhouse gas reductions in Anchorage to help meet those goals. Um, great news about it too is, Electric vehicles are great for everybody. It's kind of like, you know, uh, hug, a, hug an EV driver uh, day. Maybe we, should, uh, maybe we should start one of those uh, because the more folks who are driving electric and using electricity and generally charging overnight when our load is lower, they're better utilizing the whole electric grid, which is good for all of us because it shares the fixed costs over more energy. So it'll, it'll have a, um, an effect of bringing everybody's uh, electric prices down. So um, that's one reason that we're really um, supportive of electric vehicles. It really will be good for everybody. I've got a few assumptions up there. Those numbers are based on EPA average uh, electric vehicle, EPA average uh, internal combustion engine vehicle. So while we're talking statistics, let's jump into costs because uh, fuel cost is always something people are interested in. So today's uh, price of about 265 a gallon 
and today's price of just over 20 cents a kilowatt hour um, it, uh, for the Chugach South District. The cost for running your vehicle is about 12 cents for inter internal combustion engine compared to about seven cents per mile uh, for an electric vehicle. So again, quite a savings, that's a 42% cost reduction. Um, so interesting though, isn't it that the, um, that the carbon emissions reduction is even more than the fuel savings uh, reduction. Um, I'm scattering in my presentation here, pictures of some of the vehicles that, uh, that I tend to get excited about just because there's so many uh, new electric vehicles coming. The reason I put this one on this slide is it's uh, shaping up to be the most efficient electric vehicle out there. It seems like it's topping the charts uh, and it's expected in 2021. Let's go to the next slide. So how are we doing? If we're counting on electric vehicles helping out with this goal, how are we doing? Uh, Chugach uh, counts electric vehicles in the state by zip code um, about every six months. And we just got our most recent count, which shows that we have about 400 electric vehicles total uh, in the municipality of Anchorage. Uh, when I'm using electric vehicle here, just so you know, I'm using it generically as any vehicle that plugs in. So basically, uh, a plug-in hybrid electric uh, vehicle counts in this and a battery electric vehicle. And you can see I separated them on the two different lines. In Anchorage, you can see originally uh, back in 2018, there were many more uh, plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. So it has a gas engine and a battery, uh, then battery electric. And then as time has moved on, now battery electrics are have really picked up the pace and the plug-in hybrids seem to be uh, flat uh, or flatter, I should say, they're still growing. Uh, which is surprising because they're actually more available in town, but there are a lot of Teslas among those battery electric vehicles. And there of course isn't a dealer, but anybody can buy one and have it delivered. Statewide, it looks like this, about 1300 total um, battery electric and plug-in hybrid electric. Uh, battery electrics have ruled statewide since we started measuring. A lot of that's due to Juno, which has um, a huge number of all electric vehicles uh, in its area. So, uh, so how is that in the grant? Where do we stand? You know, those numbers are nice. They're increasing. It's nice to see the the pace is actually increasing as we are going across time. But uh, how does that look in comparison to all vehicles? The top blue line here is all vehicles registered in the municipality of Anchorage. The numbers down low here are the actual and projected um, numbers of electric vehicles across the years. And I'm sorry, it's probably small. On the left side is 2018, on the right is 2045. And these are just a bunch of scenarios uh, using Bloomberg's projections of EV sales over the next uh, um, uh, a bunch of years. Uh, I tend to think that in, in Alaska, in Anchorage in particular, we won't see the uptick that Bloomberg is projecting, but I. Um, but I do think that there, uh, so basically what I've done with our estimates is I've just added a lag, either a lag of five years or seven years or 10 years. Um, and so you can see if with a 10 year lag, we'll be at about 50,000 electric vehicles in the Anchorage area in 2045. So getting back to the metric tons of uh, emissions, if you have 50,000 vehicles by then, three metric tons per vehicle, uh, that would be about 150,000 metric tons of CO2 per year. I picked up on uh, the on, um, on our, our previous slide. I think that would be about a tenth of the state's total now, according to um, Pierce's number that he showed earlier. So uh, as part of Chugach's support for electric vehicles, we have a bunch of different programs for charging. Again, charging is going to be the area we're most involved with naturally. And this is a list of all the programs that we have right now. They're on our website, chugachelectric.com. The most popular of them is the residential charging program. It's $200 uh, credit to any of our members' bills who are charging at level two at home, uh, level two being 240 volts. Uh, we also have a commercial charging program uh, just for any business that wants to set up a charger. Workplace charging, which is intended to support employees, but it can support the public as well. Hotel, we have a fleet program. I'll mention for the fleet program too, if you have vehicles in your workplace fleet, consider electric. Um, they definitely can save some money. And the money savings I showed before was assuming you're charging at home at the home rates. 
But at a large commercial business where you have a demand charge, if you're charging at night and you're not increasing the demand charge, it's going to be really inexpensive. You're just paying for the energy portion of the bill. So that may be something to look at for your home. Um, we have a couple of programs that are pending a local company, a local rental agency having rental electric vehicles. So for example, we have a rental test drive program for our members. Uh, once there is a rental shop in town, uh, we'll, our members will be able to go and rent one for a couple of days uh, to just get the real experience because I think there's a lot of value in people driving them before they buy. So I think that's, we're thinking that that's gonna help knock down one of the barriers to purchasing. Uh, we also have a lease program for any transportation network drivers, uh, Uber or Lyft type of drivers, drivers if they're driving electric. Uh, and then we had a, uh, an electric vehicle research program that's full, that was fully subscribed, but that put some, um, put some marks on the map. We added four new stations. So this is uh, showing the plugshare.com, which is a great place to find chargers. They have a, an app too that's really handy if you're looking for a charging station. So on the left side is November, 2018, which wasn't that long ago, really. And then on the right, February, 2021, uh, uh, basically today is when I took that picture. Um, four of those new locations are ones that Chugach put in, plus there's one in Girdwood that's not shown here. And when I say put it in, um, Chugach helped with the cost of these commercial um, uh, locations. So we're really glad to have these partnerships and these additional level two charging stations out there. Uh, maybe just a quick pause to say, uh, we're really looking forward to level three charging. Uh, Alaska Energy Authority has got some uh, Volkswagen money and it looks like they're starting to go out to bid uh, for some charging stations. So I think that'll really help have some high-speed charging along Alaska's highway corridors. So I'm just gonna wrap up here with a couple of um, resources and calls to action. Uh, these are things, I'm sorry, they're kind of long uh, URLs, but uh, if you can Google for them, uh, the Chugach website I listed before, just chugachelectric.com, and you can find all of our programs. And actually, if you go to that one, uh, some of these, uh, most of these other links are in there as well. Uh, Fourth Mobility has a nice brochure of vehicles that are available on the market. Now, they're not all available in Alaska yet, but um, probably worth asking your dealer if you're interested in one of them. Uh, there's a neat article I just saw recently from Car and Driver that shows the upcoming vehicles, and that's really exciting. There are a lot of vehicles coming. Uh, a lot of the vehicles that are on the market right now are kind of the luxury and high-end um, expensive vehicles. Uh, you can buy a Porsche Taycan here in Anchorage. They've been stocking those, but uh, it's probably out of most of our uh, budgets, I would guess. Uh, uh, but the, uh, as time goes on, now they're having more and more vehicles that fit more and more of our needs and our interests and the prices are coming down as well. And finally, the plugshare.com uh, website is a resource I've added as well. And so finally, we're all giving, all of, our, all, all of us tonight are giving uh, a call to action. So here are my three. If you haven't driven an EV yet, go find a way to do it. Um, you can rent one when you're traveling. That's the picture there when I was looking at colleges with my son in California. Uh, we rented a Tesla uh, just through um, one of the typical, it wasn't a fancy car shop or anything. It was just through one of the typical uh, rental agencies you might go to. And it really didn't cost that much more. Um, and it was thrilling. It was amazing. We got a Model S um, and yeah, just amazing to drive and so much fun. Uh, you can also rent locally through our test drive program. Once that gets up and going, when the local rentals become available uh, and um, and then you can also test drive a vehicle, both locally or while you're traveling. I've done that a couple of times while traveling. I'll stop in a showroom and, uh, and try an electric vehicle that's not available in the market here in Anchorage yet. Uh, if your workplace has a vehicle fleet, consider adding an electric vehicle. I mentioned that before. It's your second call to action. And the third is if you drive electric already and you're not and you're a TrueGatch member and you're you haven't gotten your $200 credit yet, um, go ahead and apply and we'll apply that $200 to your, to your um, next bill. And that's all I have. I'm really looking forward to the questions. Oops, uh, really looking forward to the questions at the end. And um, so please keep them coming. Thank you very much. Uh, back to you, Pierce. Great, thanks so much, Sean. Um, I can also attest to the um, driving experience. We actually got to test drive some of these heavy duty electric trucks and uh, did not expect a heavy duty truck to be fun to drive. So I'll, I'll say that much. Um, thank you all so much for your questions. We see them coming through to the chat. 
Um, at the end, we'll go through and ask um, each panelist the questions. Alrighty, so up next, we have uh, Michelle McNulty. Michelle is the planning director for the municipality of Anchorage. She's a certified planner with over 14 years of planning and community development experience across the state. Prior to serving in her current role, she was a consultant at a local planning and engineering firm where she had the opportunity to work throughout Alaska on a variety of both public and private sector land use and transportation projects and community plans. Michelle's favorite part of planning is working with the public, learning more about what people value and how, the, how they live to better understand how to successfully balance community values and needs with responsible development to support the growth and success of a community. Over to you, Michelle. Hi, thanks, Pierce. Um, and I believe that there's going to be a polling question leading off. Is that correct? Perfect. So it's a, a simple yes or no. And uh, I, I think I made an assumption that more were going to be no. Um, and so kind of built my presentation around that. Um, but I do recognize a few names and, and like Sean, I'm excited to be here and see some familiar names and see that I have fellow policy wonks out there that at least I know I won't bore everybody completely. So it looks like we're about a 50-50, eh, so far 57, so a good mix. So um, pretty impressed that so many of you are aware of what the 2040 plan is and, and what it does. So um, Carrie, do you, oh, so I see a question in the chat. I'm talking about the land use uh, plan, 2040 land use plan. Sorry, I was missing a word in that. Carrie, can you pull up my presentation? Okay. Next slide. Um, so I think that Pierce mentioned this, but I just kind of wanted to remind everybody that the goal of one of the goals of the, the climate action plan is just reducing uh, greenhouse emissions by 80% from 2008 levels by 2050. And so what I'm really going to focus on is, is kind of how we do that through planning. Next slide. So in the land use uh, and transportation sector, the, the big vision is all about creating a walkable, well-designed, connected community that has um, employees mixed use development with a diverse transportation options. Um, really the objective that the climate action plan sets out is to advance land use planning. And so um, I'm really excited that a lot of my presentation is really about how we already, we have been doing that and how we're gonna continue to do that into the future. Um, doing things such as, you know, constantly amending tile 21. So it's in line with our 2040 land use plan and the metropolitan transportation plan, really focusing on where do we wanna see that infill development and um, amending code to allow things such as city centers and neighborhoods, the kind of development that, you know, in addition to electric vehicles, um, sometimes getting people out of single occupancy vehicles is a good way of reducing emissions. Next slide, please. So I'm starting with my call for action. Um, and it's simple, get involved with local planning efforts. Um, a lot of the planning efforts that we, we, we talk about and we take to the community really do ultimately end up shaping our uh, community through the implementation through, through zoning code. So while we have 2040, which is the umbrella plan, there's a lot of different functional plans such as the transportation plan and then district plans that feed into that. And all of those, focus on implementation, either through the land use plan or regulations, which is Title 21, which also informs our zoning map, but it's also how we get funding for what we want. So um, the plans actually feed into our capital improvement plan and our transportation improvement plan. So um, it's really important that we get those things in adopted plans. Next slide. So I'm gonna talk a lot about what the Anchorage, um, the land use plan is. And essentially it's a, it's a resource for um, not just the citizens, but it's a reference to public investors, developers, and public officials in making decisions regarding future land use. Um, and it's specifically where our infrastructure goes. 
It also coordinates other facility and operational planning plans, including water, wastewater, public transit, and municipal and state roadway improvements. And it really helps other agencies understand how long-term city goals um, and the way their work shapes that plan. So even if the agencies must, must focus on short-term plan needs that are out of step. So for instance, if a long-term vision for the public transit and the comprehensive plan is to build a high frequency transit network operating along many street corridors, and the short-term um, public transit really has to focus on its operations planning on a fewer number of high frequency routes where most of its riders are. So eventually the transit operations should merge with the long range vision, um, but it does take some time uh, to build that infrastructure and to bring on the housing to support um, extending the high frequency network to all areas that are envisioned in the comprehensive plan. But the 2040 land use plan does assume that over time, those infrastructure improvements um, identified in the, the different uh, functional plans, including the MTP or the Metropolitan Transportation Plan will be constructed. And then as those improvements come online, the area served can fully uh, be developed as envisioned in the 2040 land use plan, which really is the community's plan and, and the community's vision. Next slide. So uh, I'm gonna do a quick overview of kind of how we built the, the 2040 land use plan. Um, and so really the first thing we had to look at is growth projections. What do we see the population doing? Uh, so three different growth scenarios were looked at for both population and employment trends. And the plan really took the middle ground to look at those numbers. But no matter what scenario you look at, we're gonna see growth. Next slide. And so we also have to look at our available land in the Anchorage goal and figure out where are we gonna put those, where, what areas can actually absorb the growth. Um, and so we start to look at where do we already see investment and uh, development occurring and where do we see it continuing to occur? Where do we have um, the least amount of challenges from you know, natural hazards, natural resources, and where do we have the zoning that already kind of accounts for that density? And then also, um, you know, really important, the zoning and then just the existing infrastructure. Oh, next slide. And so what that really allowed us to do is take the city's comprehensive plan from the 2020 Anchorage Bowl comprehensive plan that really set out a good policy um, and identified some, you know, some nodes of where we wanted to see town centers and kind of identified major corridors. But with the 2040 land use plan, we also adopted a land use plan map that took those concepts of corridors and town centers to a new level and also um, really identified what are the designated land uses. And so that really starts to bring the connection between the land use and the roadway connections. And really start, and if you, and I, I'm sorry, I don't have a slide that shows it, but if you really look at that growth map compared to the land use plan, you can see um, like where in this map in the 2040 land use plan where there's that purple, that that's our city center intensity and that's where we see our highest density development occurring. You can see in that growth map that that's where that maroon color, which really shows the areas that can absorb that growth. Next slide, slide please. And I think that one of the single most important things that the land use plan, specifically the land use plan map did, was it entered, not only did it carry on the centers and corridors, it really identified and gives more direction of what we want to see, the type of development we wanna see in those corridors and the types of core, I'm sorry, in those types of centers, but the types of corridors or transportation segments that are gonna go uh, to match with those, with those centers. And then we introduced four growth supported features. So the two of note are really transport, transit supportive corridors, which really um, identifies where we see corridors where there's gonna be expanded public transit which will really support compact walkable pattern of commercial, residential, and mixed use development, um, as well as greenway supportive corridors, which talks about you know, incorporating development, incorporating natural open space, creek corridors, and pedestrian routes into their design. Um, we also have introduced mixed use development as a much higher priority, and then traditional neighborhood design, which is 
more typical of what you see on the East Coast and probably the best example in Anchorage is in uh, South Edition, where you have that smaller lot cottage um, feel, but they're close to the road. They have sidewalks. They have that starting to get that walkability closer to, um, to entertainment, job centers, and, and that kind of development. So really making that connection between land use and transportation. Next slide. And then, you know, we always want to look at what the Metropolitan Transportation Plan and Long Range Transportation Goals are. So for clarity for anyone that doesn't know, the MTP is adopted by the AMATS Policy Committee and the Long Range Transportation Plan is adopted by the Assembly. They typically are the same or very similar documents, um, but they don't have to be the same. So, so there can be changes, but typically we do try to keep them same just so that we don't have a lot of different conflicts in policy making decisions. While all the goals really do touch on the land use um, part of what we do in the overall planning department, I think the two most important goals that we need to, to look at with you know, land use, how it relates to transportation is really promoting environmental sustainability, which really as we introduce ways of getting people in more compact walkable um, developments, we're starting to do that. That's a much more sustainable way of using our land, getting people out of single occupancy cars um, and cutting down on different emissions. And also it really just helps with, I mean, I think it's a value statement, but I think a lot of people find that that really does help with quality of life. But it also really has a goal of, you know, making sound public investment. So looking um, at where we're putting our public infrastructure to make sure that it's supporting the types of development that we want to encourage that we know our community wants as far as, as its broader vision. Next slide, please. So since 2017, and well before that, the planning department has been working really hard on making um, changes, but um, this isn't an exhaustive list, but these are some uh, notable accomplishments that we've made since 2017 that also kind of are in line with what we see as the climate action goals. And one is just, we've recreated the R4A mixed use residential district, which is a really high density mixed use um, district that we have in our uh, city center and transit supportive corridors. Um, we've cleaned up our subdivision standards. And so just kind of simply put, it took away some of the redundancies that were actually resulting in a lot more surface parking, asphalt, um, reducing the amount of open space we were seeing in subdivisions and ultimately reducing the amount of residential units we could get on. Also doing things like trying to encourage even the creation of a front uh, porch, incentivizing that in ways to not only get people connected to their neighbors, but getting more eyes on the street so that people don't have to feel like the only way that they're safe on the right of way is in a car, that they actually can feel safe walking and, and recreating because there's people out um, participating or being part of the community. We also amended a, a tool called the Alternative Equivalent Compliance to allow um, applied out landscape requirements. And I won't get into the details of what it is, but what it essentially does is it really encourages low impact design. It allows you to use um, green drainage ways as your required landscaping and is we've we've seen it be used on several projects. So I think that that's a success after only about a year and a half of being in effect. I won't talk too much about this because I think Joni will be, but you know, we've adopted the, the MTP 2040 and our, or I guess it was approved by the Paul AMATS policy committee and we're about to adopt the long range transportation plan. And I think the big thing about those plans is now is we're starting to see the, um, the correlation between those plans and the climate action plan, and that they're starting to, to address that we do need to start preparing for metrics on how we look at greenhouse emissions. I'm super excited about this, the Spinari Corridor plan. Joni's gonna talk about this, but just this is great because it's the first district plan that really uh, focused on the land use transportation connectivity and focus on transit oriented development. And then just something other that's ha another kind of item that's happened is that the assembly recently adopted tax abatement for residential development along transit supportive corridors. Um, so really trying to incentivize development where uh, we want to see that with our transit system. Next slide. And I have two slides left. Uh, so a few things that we have in progress and some upgrade 
upcoming projects are, we're working on, uh, we're gonna be launching a parking reductions uh, and driveway widths. So minimizing the uh, minimum width of driveway widths by right in certain areas. We're already looking at amending the R4A to make it more practical to use. We're creating new tools like the small area implementation plan and most importantly, the reinvestment focus area, which really gets to that um, looking at focused infill development. <clears throat> and then uh, I think Joni's also gonna talk about this, but AMATS is working on a non-motorized trail plan. We just passed or are about to pass a local landmark ordinance, which creates a local registry for buildings and landscapes. That's really important when we talk about re, it's going to reusing buildings. So it's incentivizing that. One of the incentives is that if you're on the registry, you actually aren't required to have parking. Uh, doing the Chugach Way transportation element studies. So uh, Chugach Way, which is in Middle Spinard, is one of the priority reinvestment focus areas. And this study is looking at um, what are the infrastructures need to support the, the, the development that we want to see there. We're gonna be kicking off um, a transportation um, demand management study in the UMED district. So for anybody that's not familiar with that, transportation demand is just an application of strategies and policies to reduce travel demand or redistribute it over different times or space. Um, and then we'll already about to start kicking off the MTP 2050 and LRTP 2050. So um, last slide. So just to kind of, to close on my call to action, I hope that I've done a, you know, a good enough job of explaining why it's really important to get involved with local planning efforts. All of these planning uh, plans that I talk about really do inform and shape um, Title 21, which is how we implement the goals. And so your voice matters. I did have a poll that I forgot to ask um, Carrie to, to run, but maybe you can run that in the back end. This is more just for my knowledge. I, I think the questions really are, do you participate? And if not, why? And that's more for selfish reasons. I wanna understand if we're not getting voices from the community, why not, and how we can better engage. Thank you for your time. And I look forward to questions. Great, thank you so much, Michelle. Really appreciate you sharing what your department's done and your vision. Um, all those links that she posted will be posted um, at the Alaska Common Ground website for your review. Um, oh, great, so another poll um, based on Michelle's last question here. Okay, so while that's running, I can go ahead and get us queued up for the next speaker. Um, we'll be going on to Joni Wilm. Joni grew up in Fairbanks and is a senior planner and bicycle and pedestrian coordinator with Anchorage Metropolitan Area Transportation Planning Solutions, which is AMATS. She has over 14 years experience working in both private and public sectors in the fields of urban design, land use planning, transportation planning, and transit oriented development planning. Her latest projects include the AMATS non-motorized plan, the Spinard corridor plan, the AMATS Complete Streets Policy, Urban Streets Anchorage Magazine, and the AMATS Street Typologies Plan. Joni is passionate about making Alaska a great place to live, work, and play, and in her spare time can be found hiking, skiing, biking, running, and walking around Anchorage and our gorgeous mountain ranges. Okay, great. So before I hand it off to you, Joni, wanted to just quickly run through this poll that we have up here. Uh, the question was, do you frequently participate in the development of community plans, such as the comprehensive plans, neighborhood plans, or transportation plans? We had about a 34% breakdown between yes and 66% on no. And the second question was, if you have never participated in community plan efforts or don't participate often, what is the primary reason? Looks like by far the majority of folks said, I never hear about these opportunities and don't know where to go to find out about these, 41%. 3% said none of the planning efforts I have heard about have an impact on my property or quality of life. And then 12% said, I don't feel like my voice makes a difference. So some things that we need to change there for sure. Thanks for your responses. Okay, so we can get queued up for um, Joni's presentation. Joni, will you be sharing your presentation or is Kari? Yes, I'm gonna share my presentation. I'm gonna try to do that now. Can everyone see it? Yep, 
just uh, yep perfect okay. and Joni, do you want me to launch your poll questions um you know what i might i have a lot of slides so maybe if we could just do that at the very end let me know when okay great we'll just do that at the end so make sure i get through all these but i'm so impressed with everyone they're so calm presenting i have all these slides so i try to be calm too but uh I'm, i'll try to also get through them so anyways Thanks again for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here today um, virtually. And um, just it's really exciting hearing everyone talk about how all of these are linking together. I think 10 years at the Muni, I'm finally, you know, feeling like, yes, everything is linking together and it's pretty exciting. So um, again, my name is Joni Wilm. I'm a transportation planner with AMATS, which is our local metropolitan planning organization. And today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, linking land use and transportation planning. Michelle uh, already uh, set us up quite well for what, what we're going to be going over today. So you guys are um, keyed into what we're what we're talking about. But I'm just going to touch on our complete streets policy that we have passed uh, for AMATS. A uh, little bit about transit oriented development, street typologies that you heard uh, mentioned before, and then dive into the Spinard Quarter plan and now motorized plan just real uh, quickly on those two. So, um, okay, so first of all, um, complete streets policy, I would say this was the forefront for us, like even before transit oriented development. Um, this has been a movement to make streets basically safe and comfortable for all users. So that's the gist of what Complete Streets is trying to do. We adopted our com Complete Streets policy in um, 2018. I can't read the right side of my screen there, but um, 2018. So AMATS now has an official policy. So we are making sure that when people submit projects for nominations that they're including how they intend to make that street as complete as possible. Not every street can look like the one featured here, which has all the bells and whistles, as you can see, nice wide promenades, nice uh, marked crosswalk, beautiful bike lanes, parking and landscaping. Um, so this has got everything. And not every street can look like this, of course, but as much as possible, we wanna make our streets um, more friendly, more safe, so for all users and not just vehicles. So that's our complete streets policy that is uh, has been in place since 2018. Um, also just, and I know Michelle has already talked about this, but transit oriented development. So just to give you an idea of what that's all about, I would say in the last four to five years, we've been moving towards this. That was kind of when we kicked off the Spinard Road Corridor plan. Um, but basically transit oriented development is a new type of planning that's trying to integrate transportation and land use really trying to emphasize a compact environment and um, a dense environment where people can live um, close to where they work, close to where they can um, close to where they can access transit, trying to connect folks from where they live to where they work and play and go to school um, and all of those types of things. You want a nice mix of uses. So we're talking um, commercial, residential, um, retail, uh, business and office spaces as, as well as residential. So a nice mix of, trans, of land uses. Also wanna connect bicyclists and walkers um, as much as possible through a, um, this is transit or development, we call it a TOD just as a acronym there. But, and then lastly, I'm just gonna to touch on this briefly and I know we mentioned it earlier, but we are also embarking on a street typologies plan. This was part of the OSNHP, the official streets and highways plan that AMATS um, or that the municipality adopted. Um, I believe it was in 2013. And um, we have street typologies laid out in that plan. We are taking another look at those street typologies because it's come a long way since 2013. So we're gonna be coming up with our own street typologies that fit um, Anchorage uh, and the AMATS area. These are some examples from um, the Seattle DOT street typologies plan. If you're unfamiliar with street typologies, basically what it does is it combines um, what's happening in the land around the street with what the street is classified as. So no longer are you just looking at a street as arterial collector, um, major arterial, that type of thing, which really designates the speed and um, 
how the traffic moves. Now what we're trying to do is incorporate, okay, what's going on at the land um, use around the street and how should that influence the design of the street? So that's just a very brief highlight. We'll be going into more of that um, later on after the non-motorized plan is adopted, but it's pretty exciting. And it's another tool for us to integrate land use and transportation. Um, okay, so just the Spinard Corridor Plan. This was adopted in November of 2020. So this was a big push for us. We are very excited to have this done. Um, it is, as Michelle mentioned, our very first transit oriented development plan or TOD plan. Again, it combines transportation and land use planning in one document. We've never done that before. There've always been separate efforts. So land use has been done by long range planning. Transportation planning has been done by AMATS. So this was um, done together as one. It was funded by Federal Highways Administration and we had a local match. And then again, we had two project managers, myself, and then Feed Tobish with our um, long range planning department. So um, this, just a, I'm gonna go through some brief slides here that I used for the Spinner Quarter Plan, but this was our planning area. The planning area was decided um, based on the corridor. So as you can see, Spinard Road, um, and the orange running up through here. We decided on the parameters based on about a quarter to a half mile uh, distance from the road, which is basically when you're looking at transit, when you want people to be able to connect to transit, you're looking at an area where they'll um, reasonably walk to transit to catch transit. And that's uh, national trends are showing that that's between a quarter and a half mile. So that's kind of how we decided on our, our parameters there. Um, the very first, uh, during the very first process and public involvement workshop we held with the plan, our consultants um, divided the Spinner Quarter into three basic sections. So breaking it down into a North District, a Central District, and a South District. And each district has different characteristics. So the North District was more like the entertainment, um, urban district. We've got festival streets planned up there. The central district is more a uh, traditional neighborhood, but we also have it as a transit supportive um, cord, uh, what's all this transit cord quarter, but transit supportive um, development. So it's more transit uh, centers in the central district. And then the south district, that is connection mostly and has been traditionally for a long time connected to the airport. There's more hotels there. There's also a lot of uh, longstanding local residential development there. So we wanted to keep that in play for folks. And we've also incorporated some new, um, some new interesting amenities for people that live in the area. Um, this framework map that came out of the plan is a good example of something that we haven't really done before. So this map incorporates the districts that I was just talking about with transportation um, facilities. So in this map, you can see primary and secondary networks in these blue, um, this is smaller and thicker blue lines. And they show existing and future primary and secondary networks uh, going into and out of the planning area. We also have uh, gateways. These are this kind of hot pink circles here. Those are areas where, where you're coming into, into and out of the neighborhood and you realize that you've entered Spinard or you're leaving Spinard. Um, so those are really important for developing a sense of place in a community. We also have um, enhanced uh, crossings shown in this map. We have parking, potential parking spots in these little keys here, um, as well as parks, areas for parks and community nodes and um, some other investment areas. You can see our little festival streets highlighted here, um, as well as uh, intersections that we've identified for improvement when you do an, a metropolitan transportation plan or a long range transportation plan, it's helpful to know where those are so you can know where to invest your, um, where you might need to invest dollars. Uh, this is just a dialed down version of uh, that map without more land use, just looking at the um, <clears throat> transportation connectivity. And then of course, <clears throat> excuse me, and then of course we also uh, have a, um, a lot of information about land use designations and, and new, newer land uses that we're trying to see in this, all throughout this area. 
We've identified parking zones for folks. These are kind of around nodes where folks can park and then walk to um, businesses, restaurants, that type of thing. Um, we also in this plan have, we had local uh, architects on the project, which was great because um, they did up these really nice drawings for us. So this is an example of what we have in the North District where we had some festival streets planned. So these are kind of examples of what a festival street could potentially look like um, with some green space. For each, so for each district, we had our architects draw <clears throat> some uh, conceptual designs, which is fun and gives folks an idea of what's possible. For the central district, um, this was again our transit heavy, more transit heavy district with transit um, centers. And so we showed an example of what those could potentially look like as well as some multi-use uh, multi use buildings. And then the South District, which, which is a lot of residential and hotel space, we um, showed potentially what some residential could look like there as well as um, some urban, urban amenities like a, urban, a neighborhood garden and things like that. So these are, this is super helpful just to get people an idea of what's possible. Um, this plan also had circulation policies as part of the document. We had um, conceptual uh, road diagrams in here. This one's interesting. We have a lot of roads in Anchorage and in the Spinard area that are limited right of way where they're um, 30 feet right of way. So Chugatchway is a good example. Um, and it's hard to know how to um, fashion that street in a way that makes it more friendly towards bicyclists and pedestrians. Um, so we had our consultants draw up some different options for folks so that they can see what's possible. Um, so that was really that was really interesting. We also have bike amenities listed in the plan and parking policies. And then finally, um, and then of course this I'm just blown through this real quick, but finally, we have our implementation chapter, and this is always, as a planner, I say the most important chapter of any plan, because what you don't want is the plan to go sit on a shelf for many years. You want the community to um, implement it. And so the implementation chapter is really key because it lists not only the policies in the plan, but most importantly, what are the action items that we need to focus on doing first? Um, and you know, who are the partners that need to work together on implementing these action items? What's the time frame? Is it short term, mid term, or long term? And then what's the funding required or potential funding that might be needed to implement? So that's super key. That's all I'm going to say about the Spinar quarter plan, but you get some of the idea of what we're doing there. Um, the non motorized plan is the document that's up for public comment right now. So um, I'm going to talk about my action item or my call to action at the end. But basically, I'll just run through a few slides from this non-motorized plan. And most of you have probably seen this presentation because I've been giving it around the community for uh, over a month now. So I've been to a lot of community council meetings, but um, there's seven chapters to the plan. Uh, so we've got uh, intro, existing conditions and public involvement. All those three chapters lead up to what we recommend in chapter four, which is how the network should be built out. Chapter five takes those network recommendations that are in chapter four and prioritizes them um, as high, medium, or low priority. And then finally, our implementation chapter, again, a really important chapter, and then a design guide um, uh, at the end. So just real briefly, this non-motorized plan um, basically focuses on the three networks that we identify, the pedestrian, bicycle, and shared use path network within the AMATS area. We included a vision statement and there's goal, uh, goals associated with that vision statement. These goals can be found throughout the document. Um, and then again, in the implementation section, we used uh, most current crash data that we could get our hands on, which was the Vision Zero plan that was adopted in 20, I believe it was adopted in 2018. We also did level of traffic stress analysis on existing roadways um, to look at the level of stress uh, that folks are being exposed to when they're trying to um, move along these, these different roadways. Um, we did a demand analysis to look at where folks live, work, play, shop, access transit and go to school. 
We also looked at health and equity indicators. So here's the health indicators, and then here are equity indicators. Um, and to find out where our most vulnerable populations are, which is really key for us to figure out where we need to spend, where we need to focus on to make the most safety improvements. Um, we also had an extensive public involvement, um, extensive public involvement uh, process, which was uh, about three and a half years of workshops and presentations, interviews, we did field data uh, collection, we did walk audits and an online community survey and an app that folks could use to, um, to get on and um, log uh, comments when they're out on the trails. Uh, we had two advisory committees also that were active during out during our process um, and then chapter four is like i mentioned before taking the info from one two and three and using that to say what we how we should develop our network so you can see here's an example of the bike network so we're recommending enhanced shared roadways in the purple separated bikeways and shared use pathways and unfortunately, I don't have time today to go over each of those facilities and what they are, but there's lots of information in the plan about that. Um, here's our uh, pedestrian network recommendations. And for PEDS, we recommended corridors instead of listing individual projects. One main reason we did this was because we only implemented a handful of projects from our last pedestrian plan, which was adopted in 2010, I believe. And so we are including all the projects from that existing plan and then also identifying priority corridors um, using all the data that I talked about in the existing conditions chapter. Um, and then prioritization, this is how we took what we just looked at as far as network development and prioritized it. We used six criteria um, and I've listed them here to show sort of how they were weighted. So connectivity is weighted the highest Health and equity gap closure and safety are all weighted about the same. And then public support, did it show up in this process or previous support? Did it show up in a previous planning process? We're all used to um, come up with a ranking score for each project that we recommend. So here are those bike network um, projects that I showed you already, but now they're prioritized high, medium and low. And um, we did the same thing for the pedestrian projects. So high, medium, and low corridor. This is super helpful for us as planners to figure out where we need to focus on. We only have so many dollars, so what's gonna give us the, the best result for the money that we have. And then um, chapter six is implementation. I'll just, uh, um, just breeze through this one, but basically we wanted example projects for folks to look at um, so they could uh, if they were going to recommend a project, they knew kind of what was involved. So they, we had project descriptions and challenges and conceptual design costs and all that type of thing. We had six different types of projects in this chapter. So intersection, a trail crossing, a complete streets renovation, a bike boulevard, sidewalk infill, and creating a, a multi-use pathway. So our consultants, r &M, did a really nice job of um, drawing up some concept conceptual designs for us. So this one is from the intersection project. This is Cordoba Street and 10th Avenue. And so in addition to this nice um, design that they did for us, they also listed potential project challenges, some maintenance cost uh, estimates, as well as project cost estimates, including engineering, construction, utility relocation, construction engineering, and contingency, uh, as well as some funding options and some implementation um, timelines. So that's chapter six. I took out a bunch of slides from chapter six, but there's a lot more in there than this, but these were kind of the main highlights. And then um, chapter six also has, like the Spinner Corridor Plan, an implementat implementation matrix, which I feel is one of the key elements of any plan, like I mentioned before. This one also has implementation action items, a related policy or goal of the funding sources, potential funding sources and potential funding partners or just uh, implementation partners. And again, is listed in immediate, midterm and long-term timeframes. So it's really easy for folks to see 
what what should we do first? You know, what do we do in the first two years and that type of thing? Um, and then this last slide, uh, this is our chapter seven design guide. Uh, it's full of really great um, design um, guidance. It is uh, our main consultant was out of planning and design and they are leading experts in the field of uh, non-motorized planning. So we really wanted to utilize all of their great design skills. They also are key writers for all of the NACTO design guides. If anyone knows what those are, I'm sure some of you do, but they're sort of the leading edge design guides that are out there for bicycles and pedestrians and transit. And so we wanted to utilize that. So we have a whole chapter on design guidance. And then lastly, uh, is that my last slide? No. Here's what's happening now. The plan is out for public review. That's the um, non-motorized plan. So um, we are taking comment through March 5th. So, uh, and I'll, that'll be my call to action next slide. But uh, after that, we will be taking the plan, logging all of our comments, responding to them, and then taking it to the technical advisory committee for AMATS in hopefully April. And after that, um, hopefully to the assembly in May. And then after that, to the policy committee for final review and approval, hopefully in June, but um, it may be July or August. So a lot of times it takes us longer to get through the process um, than we think it does. So last slide for me, here's the call to action. Please, uh, thank you again for having me. Please read the AMAT Snow Motorized Plan. It's very big, but it's well worth it. It's on the AMATS website, which is at the link here, and I will share in the um, in the chat box. Can submit comments to AMATS info at anchorjk.gov or me personally at Joni Wilma anchorjk.gov. We have two surveys on there, which you can take. We created these little QR codes, which are awesome. Our well, our new transportation uh, public involvement planner Christine Schuette created these for us, but. Uh, so take the surveys one and two. And then lastly, I'm going to reiterate what Michelle said, which is to get involved in your local community council um, and community planning efforts. And that's Great. all I've got. And we can Thanks so much, it. Joni. Great. Really Did appreciate I'm way that. over time probably, huh? Uh, well, yeah, we'll scoot over to Bart real quick okay. next. Um, so thank you so much. Next, we've got Bart Rudolph. Uh, Bart is the Planning and Communications Manager for the Municipality of Anchorage Public Transportation Department. He oversees the long and short-term planning efforts, bus route scheduling, rideshare program, and marketing initiatives. He led the effort to redesign the city's bus system in 2017 and works to build on its success by implementing the recently approved transit plan called Transit on the Move. He has 15 years of transportation planning experience. Prior to joining the MOA, Bart served as a transportation planning manager for the Alaska Department of Transportation and Public Facilities in Central Region. Alrighty, Bart, take it away. Great, can you see my screen okay? Yep. Awesome. Um, so I'll go as quick as possible. Um, thanks for having me. The Public Transportation Department has three divisions, and um, I'll go over them each one individually here, People Mover, Ride Share, and Anchor Rides. And I will warn you, I have a lot of call to actions, and I love QR codes too, so get your phones ready and you can scan away. But uh, I will try and tie this back to the um, Climate Action Plan, which objective number six, as we've already discussed, is to increase the use of public transit and non-motorized transportation. Obviously, I'm gonna focus on public transit, and had we had this conversation a year ago, I would be ecstatic. This is a great time. Ridership is on the increase for the first time in over a decade. Then 2020 happened. We all know what happened there. Pandemics and putting people in a tight confined space together don't necessarily go well together. So we are no longer trying to get new people to experience people mover right now. We are simply here to provide the trips that are essential to the people that need them. What does 2021 look like? We don't know. We're not ready to welcome riders back to our system yet. We hope that we can do that soon, um, but we are taking all the precautions necessary to keep our system running right now. So I will just do a quick um, recap of what our system is. In 2017, we did a major system redesign. We introduced a 15 minute peak frequency. The red lines in the map are routes that come every 15 minutes. The blue is 30, green 60, the purple is kind of a hybrid of 15 and 30. Um, as 
Michelle mentioned, that there, it's no coincidence that our 15-minute frequent routes are on transit-supported corridors from the land use plan map. Um, there is no transit-supported corridor that doesn't have a transit line on it. Um, they're not all of the frequency that we want, but it always becomes that, what I call the chicken or egg. Do you have the land use first or do you put the transit first? There are some parts of town now that we have put transit first. And as you can see with Michelle and Joni, they are doing all the work necessary to have the land use come in and fill in and, and add that density that we really need to make frequent transit work here in Anchorage. So there, we had a lot of system goals um, really to reverse declining ridership. We really wanted to make public transit a viable option, um, build community support uh, for transit, create a system that supports future growth, future land use growth, but also, also future growth for the system itself. We wanted this to be the backbone of a, of a system that we could fill in over the years. So here's our ridership graph from the past uh, decade or so. To the far right is 2008. And then you can see uh, where it stops is right before we implemented the new system in 2017. Um, ridership was on a, a downward spiral. Um, if we would have continued that trend, that's what it would have looked like. Here's what, what happened. And by August of 2019, we were almost back to 2015 levels. We had reversed a decade of ridership decline with the new system. Um, and actually 2019 was a stellar year for ridership. Every single month in 2019 had a ridership increase when we compared it to 2018. The red lines are 2019, the blue lines are 2018. And you can see every month ridership increase across the board. In 2019, we have a system report card. We put out a system report card every year. It's available in multiple languages down in the corner. Um, but 2019, 5% increase in ridership, 3.4 million rides. There's a lot of information in this report, but at the bottom of the screen, you'll see we have, our riders had 15.6 million passenger miles travel on our buses. So those would have been miles that would have been either in a car or a bike or walking. Basically, they were off the street and put onto a bus. So COVID happened. Here's our ridership graph. I won't spend too much time in it, but on the far left is March 2020. Then by April, we go down to basically zero. Each of the bars, the, the blue and the white bars, represent when we have rider capacities. So you can see right at the very beginning in March, that skinny blue bar, that time period is when we were actually going fare free. We had a nine rider limit. Then when the white part stop starts in April, uh, we actually suspended bus service. Um, we had another service stand up in its place just for essential trips where people had to call ahead. We were only going to grocery stores and work locations, only doing a couple hundred rides a day. Uh, and during that time, we were doing things like putting plexiglass barriers in our bus. We were working on how to sanitize it, getting the foggers and the sprayers and the chemicals that was back when it was hard to get PPE. We were trying to get all that stuff ready so that we could reopen as, as quick as we could. In June, we, we came back with a nine rider limit. Then in um, almost in July, we increased it to 18. In August, back down to 14, we're trying to follow the emergency orders and how many people could be in a space at a time. Um, and then in the far right, that's where we are today. Masks are required. We have a 14 rider limit on our 40 foot buses, a six rider limit on our 22 foot buses. Um, and just how to read this graph, the dotted line at the top is where ridership was the prior year. And then the blue up and down line, that's where we are today. So we're at 50% of where we were at this time last year. Um, and we won't go higher than that until we are able to remove that rider limit. And chances are we're not going to do that soon because the reason that, that we're there is for the physical distancing. So we did do a rider survey during November just to see what um, why people are riding, where are they going? And most people are still using People Mover to, to get to groceries, to get to work, and to get to medical appointments. And that really just goes to show what an essential service this is. And you know, a huge shout out to the bus operators, really the frontline essential people who are there day after day, working, interacting with hundreds of people, just trying to get them to the grocery store and to work. People are still riding. And the good news is down here in the corner, of the people that, that were surveyed, only 3% said that they would not return after the pandemic. So we hope that a lot of riders that are currently sitting this one out 
are going to come back in the shape of these zones. Tying this back into the climate action plan, there is an action item to develop a short range transit plan. We did that and was finalized in February of 2020. Over 1,500 comments, 600 people participated in at least three event series. We had more people participate outside of those event series. And basically what this plan does, it asks the question, if we get additional funding, how should we spend it? And we prioritized future projects for each of the divisions for people mover, rideshare, and anchor ride. Um, 29 for people mover, three for rideshare, four for anchor ride. Here's your first QR code to scan. This will take you to the transit on the move document if you want to read it in more detail. But basically, the top ranked project was a new route that went on the Old Seward Highway to the Lusack Library, went into West Anchorage and down uh, to downtown. Um, so this one, there was a lot of support for it in the plan. We focused the community support to this one prioritized project. They contacted the assembly. The assembly agreed. The assembly worked with us. They approved matching grant funding in 2020 to implement this route. We were, we were working to implement it in August of 2020, uh, but it is tied with the redevelopment project of the transit center with ACPA. That project got delayed, delayed this implementation, so now we're hoping to still implement this route in the summer of fall of 2020. 2021 sorry. Another action item in the climate action plan is to expand participation to employee sponsored pass programs. So we have a lot of partners where their employees and their students can ride for free. Um, and the Anchorage School District, just to point out, when school is in session, just the secondary and high school students make up 6% of our ridership when they're riding during the school year. Um, UAA, all the universities down at the bottom, huge riderships for us. And the best thing with partnering with schools and universities is young riders grow up to be adult riders and they train their children to be riders. So we love getting people when they're young. And we are growing the program. We're making progress. In October of 2020, we welcomed Providence Medical Center. So now all of their employees can ride people mover for free as well. Another action item, promote the reduced fare program on people mover and create a youth ride free. So we do have some groups that can ride for free. Seniors ride free on Wednesdays. And I know that a senior is not a 60 year old, but people 60 and over can ride for free. And as I get closer to 60, I realize that that is not old at all, but it is people 60 plus can ride free on Wednesday. It's our highest ridership day. Um, so more people ride the bus on Wednesday than any other day probably because of this program. In transit on the move, we have an action item to do a fair analysis study. We're going to get work on that probably this year. And then just last month, our Public Transit Advisory Board passed a resolution supporting the system going fare free um, in its entirety. So there's a lot of work to be done more on this program to see um, how we can expand our fares and reduce some barriers. Pierce mentioned at the very beginning, this is a huge deal. I'm very excited. We worked for years to get fat tire bike racks on our bus. So this really goes to connect public transit and non-motorized transportation in a winter city. Now all of our buses um, can accommodate every type of bike. That's a big deal. Um, very excited about it. Your first call to action, well, several call to actions is support transit initiatives, bonds, anything that's happening in your community with transit. Even if you don't ride transit, I hope that you understand how important it is to the community and the services that it performs. Um, you can adopt a bus stop if there's a stop in front of your house or your business or a place where you work. We will help you get cleaning supplies and you can help shuffle snow and you can adopt that bus stop. Try the new-ish system. It's almost three years old now, so, um, but do it after COVID. Don't, don't ride the bus now unless you have to because we are having rider limits and you don't want to take the place of somebody who actually needs it to the grocery store. And join our email list. You can scan that QR code and that will send an email asking to join the list. Anchor rides, same thing. Ridership is down. Um, anchor rides is for people 60 and over, and it's also for people with a disability that prevents them from riding a people mover bus. Um, so the, the majority of these trips right now are for medical and work. That's pretty much the same as it is um, every year, but that system is still running. And being good stewards in the community, trying to keep people at work with the anchor rides is 
really forming partnerships. They've done an excellent job. They've worked with the Food Bank of Alaska to deliver a Thanksgiving meal. We're working with Anchorage Animal Care and Control. They have a pet food bank. So if people can't afford pet food or if they need pet food, um, and if they qualify for Anchor Rides, Anchor Rides will now go, go pick it up and deliver it to them. Um, we're helping seniors get the vaccination appointments, and they started a grocery delivery program um, where they never have to leave the house. They could order groceries from Fred Myers or something from Target. We will go pick it up and deliver it to their house if they don't feel safe leaving their house or being on public transportation. Sorry, I'm going through this really quick. Um, spreading the word for Anchor Rides, just let people know. If you know somebody 60 and over that needs pet food or would uh, like the grocery delivery program, give Anchor Rides a call. And uh, There is a sign up eligibility process that they have to do first. Finally, uh, another action item is to encourage carpooling. Um, so we have a program called Rideshare, and we partner with Enterprise Car Rentals. Um, and the big deal with this is before, if you were in a carpool, you got one of those big 13 passenger white vans, and we would cram it with full of 13 people, and that would be your carpool. Now, because we're with Enterprise, you get a brand new SUV or a car. Groups can be anywhere from five to 15. Uh, we are now giving everyone who is part of this program free passes to People Mover so that when you get into Anchorage or your place of work, you're not stuck there. If you want to run an errand or go to the grocery store, uh, go to lunch, you can get on People Mover for free. You're not stranded. We provide a $300 subsidy every month to the Vanpool Group to help with the cost that's funded by uh, Joni's Group AMAX. Uh, and the good news is a lot of these go to JBear because our buses don't go to JBear. Uh, so they're filling that void with carpooling. Um, and just to show the benefits of carpools, in 2019, we had 82 carpools, um, and they took 7 million vehicle miles off the Glen Highway. In 2020, it was down, obviously. Uh, a lot of people working from home, not wanting to carpool. We're down to about 500 participants, but only 350 are actually riding in. So um, just last year, 4.6 million vehicle miles taken off the Glen Highway with this program. So your call to action with Rideshare is to talk to your employer about supporting the carpool program. There's federal incentives. There are things that your uh, company can do to help promote it. Um, and if you want to sign up or see if you match with anybody, go to commutewithenterprise.com or click this QR code. And then finally, my last slide is if you are excited about all three of these, People Move a Rideshare and Anchorage, I encourage you to join our Public Transit Advisory Board uh, we have two openings. There'll be another opening later. Uh, so this is a public citizen volunteer board um, appointed by the mayor, approved by the assembly. We meet the second Thursday of every month. So if you don't, if you don't want to join, you can participate in these meetings. But this is all things transit. And everything we do pretty much runs through this board. So uh, that is your best way to get involved with public transportation. So I hope that that works. Hope that was quick. Excellent, Bart. Thank you so much for running through those um, so quickly and sharing some of those amazing initiatives that People Mover has undertaken. Um, great to hear. So I know we're right up against time. We've gone over with presentations, but uh, Common Ground has authorized us to go 10 minutes over. So as speakers, if you're able to stay for a few more minutes, um, that would be fantastic. We've gotten a ton of really good questions. And so I'm going to speed through as many as we can to make sure we get those questions answered. Um, I'm going to start off with the first one here. Um, this is over to Michelle. Um, we had a comment slash question that was, shouldn't the transit supportive corridors emphasize a design that prioritizes pedestrians and bicyclists rather than automobiles, like designs that encourage speeds more appropriate for non-motorized transportation, like three miles per hour for pedestrians and 10 to 12 for bicyclists? Seems like the street typology should add something akin to a, and this is a German word, I believe, or Dutch word, Wunerf, and I didn't butcher that, um, this is a Dutch term for a pedestrian street. So Michelle, I wanted to see if you could comment on that one. Definitely, thank you. Um, I'm actually really excited to say as part of the subdivision uh, cleanup that we did, we actually introduced Wernoff streets to Tile 21. Um, so it is actually a roadway that we recognize as being integral to, to uh, developments. I do think it's appropriate in some applications. I think uh, Joni is working on street typologies project and I definitely think that I don't want to speak for her but I suspect that will be something that she's looking at 
as well as a um, something to look at for, for some of our transit supportive corridors and other corridors. Excellent, great. Thank you so much, Michelle. I um, had another one come in that was, if a resident hoped to add um, greenhouse gas emissions to the long range transportation plans like MTP 2040 or 2050, um, how would they go about doing that? Um, and I think that would be best for Joni. Um, okay, uh, so was the question again, if, there, if a resident wanted to add greenhouse gas emissions to planning goals in the Correct. MTP? Yep. Um, okay, I'm I'm not the uh, project manager for the MTP or the LRTP, but I think that um, probably I would say getting uh, in, I think that would be best to do like in a tip form. So when you nominate a project for the transportation improvement program, which those projects are then listed in the MTP, um, that you would explain how your project was going to reduce greenhouse gases um, or come up with an estimate to reduce greenhouse gases. I don't know, that's probably a great question to see like if the MTP has actual goals. It sounds like it doesn't have any actual greenhouse gas reduction emission goals in the actual document, but um, that, would be, that, would be, that would be what I would recommend including those in the document as performance measures, and then also in the TIP process. Okay, great. Before a project is funded, yeah. Um, great, so bouncing around here, I got the one for Sean. Um, since Anchorage's electricity is produced by natural gas, doesn't the carbon footprint of that outweigh increased use of electric vehicles, et cetera? Yeah, it's, it's a great and interesting question. Um, the, well, let's see. So the, the generation here in Anchorage uh, on the Chugach grid is about 20% hydro, about 4% wind, and the rest is very efficient natural gas generation. So the generation is actually pretty low per um, uh, CO2 per megawatt hour produced. Um, and then that's competing against really inefficient internal combustion engines where it's like 12 to 30% of the fuel content of the electric, of the gas vehicle, of the gasoline, only 12 to 30% uh, actually propels the vehicle forward. Most of the rest of it is lost as heat. So it's kind of easy to compete against such inefficient internal combustion engine um, vehicles. And uh, electric vehicles are just, you know, super efficient. Um, uh, yeah, I think that pretty well answers it. Uh, so addresses both our, our, our mix and the inefficiencies versus efficiencies of the vehicles. Great, thanks so much, Sean. And yeah, another another thing we could put in the resource folder. I think uh, Tim Leach mentioned a, a calculator for greenhouse gas emissions in electric vehicles. So something we'll we'll add to the Common Ground website if it doesn't exist there already. Um, kind of a broad question for everybody, and then I can I can speak to this. And if anybody has something to add, um, we can we can add. But um, how does how do municipal departments and AMATs integrate the climate action plan in decision making and planning? Um, and I'll speak to this really quick. We host a resiliency sub cabinet that meets quarterly where department heads get together and discuss um, progress on goal areas that they're responsible for and uh, problem solve those with other departments. So if there's any um, cross pollination that needs to happen, it happens at that meeting. Um, do, do any other panelists have anything to add about how they individually have incorporated uh, climate action goals into their planning uh, and, and other processes? I am muted, I am muted, okay. <laughs> I think just what we talked about previously about, uh, you know, the climate action goals that, that go along with trying to plan so that people don't have to get in their car. So this transportation oriented development planning, you know, and also improving non motorized facilities so that again, people are able to not to choose not to drive their car if they want to. So, I mean, I think those are the main ways that we are that we are doing it. Great. Thanks, Joni. Um, another another one for you. Um, Anchorage is in Winter City. What are the ways that AMATS is planning uh, to, to have facilities for pedestrians and cyclists um, that are available in the wintertime? 
Yep. So we, um, so maintenance is a huge uh, issue and uh, uh, it is, and uh, you know, it always will be, but um, we are, we have incorporated in our non-motorized plan, a maintenance section. We are planning on doing a second maintenance forum. We did one maintenance forum at the beginning of our planning process for the non-motorized plan. We're doing a second maintenance forum at the tail end. What we really want to do is find a way to um, collaborate because it's right now it's a collaboration issue between um, all of our our municipal maintenance, DOT maintenance, and parks maintenance um, to and a timing issue to make sure that we're all uh, talking and communicating together. The second huge piece of that is funding. So, um, and I personally, and I've been saying this for a while now, I think that as a state, we need to reprioritize how we um, value maintenance and winter being able to get around in the winter. And when I say that, I mean, we need to fund it. Uh, in a way that we can actually do a really good job of making sure that streets and pathways are clear for folks during the winter, um, like they do in other countries, such as Finland, um, where they clear the roads at three centimeters. When there's three centimeters of snow, the roads are cleared, period, end of story. It's not partisan. There's no discussion. It's not, um, everyone agrees that, that it needs to be done and they fund it. The third thing that I'll say is, um, I think what we need to do moving forward, and we are having this as an uh, item at the end of our non-motorized plan, but um, we're going to create a, a prioritized maintenance map for winter time. A lot of cities have recognized that they can't maintain everything in the winter. They just don't have the resources. And I think that's true for Anchorage and our area. So deciding which of those routes are most important to get folks from, especially folks that really need and rely on our non-motorized systems, what can we really commit to maintaining and then pick a prioritized maintenance route. It's just some of our facilities, not all of our facilities, and then commit to maintaining that regularly so that folks can depend on that every day of the winter to be able to get around and get their needs met. Great. Thanks so much, Joni. Um, wanted to make sure we get, well, I don't want to leave you out, Bart. I'm sure you're uh, really craving a question here. So we'll start with you on this one, but it's really for everybody. Um, in your professional opinion, what municipality of Anchorage policy shift could add the highest impact for reducing greenhouse gas emissions? And I guess maybe take this one from the perspective of something that um, your department could do or is currently working on. Um, that could have that the biggest impact in in emissions. So, um, Bart, why don't we start with you? Um, well, that's a good question. I mean, the biggest impact from the transit department is to get as many people out of single occupancy vehicles and onto transit or non motorized use. Um, so, I'd say policy policy initiative is make it easier to walk and bike. Um, every transit user is a pedestrian or a bicyclist, so snow on sidewalks is always a big issue. And I know the street maintenance groups do the best they can. We partner with them um, and they're limited on their budget. So that's probably the biggest hurdle during the winter to get people to use transit. Excellent, thanks, thanks so much, Bart. Um, we'll move over to Michelle. Do you have anything to add to that question? The kind of the game changing policy or something that you think would be the, the biggest priority for reducing greenhouse gas emissions? Um, so kind of adding on to, to what Bart just said, I mean, it really is increasing the ridership, which is making sure that we have the right land uses and transportation. So I think for planning department, something that we are doing is really trying to look at ways that we can incentivize the type of development that we want, um, that the land use plan is calling for to help, you know, start that stream of events to happen, get the, get, get the riders there um, so that they can start to increase their, their ridership. Great, thanks, Michelle. Um, go over to Sean, what do you think uh, would be the biggest game changing policy? I know you're not um, with the municipality, but I think maybe as an outsider's view, um, what do you see as the most beneficial thing? Well, I'm gonna stick to my wheelhouse, which is electric. <laughs> so uh, not a land use transportation thing, but hey, if our electric system was all renewable, uh, you know, we'd be able to drive with, uh, with carbon free and, um, you know, use electricity in our homes and businesses carbon free. Uh, we'd love to add more renewables, but we always have to balance that with cost. Um, we'd love to see renewables come in at lower than lower than or at our current cost. Um, 
uh, that would be an easy choice if it was, uh, it, but if it's more higher cost, we need to watch that so we're not increasing costs to members all across the city. Great, yeah, thanks, Sean. And then um, finally, Joni, what do you think would be the biggest uh, kind of game-changing policy or, or, or most important thing we can do to reduce emissions? Um, the most important thing policy-wise? Oh my gosh, okay. Uh, well, that's a tough question. I don't it's know, a big there's, question. There's so many things. Um, well, honestly, okay, and I know this is, this is not, you know what, and I'm not just saying this because I enjoy working from home, but um, I think that it, with COVID, I think we have, um, you know, we have given folks another option of, of going to work and commuting to work and that type of thing. I would be really interested to see how emissions have decreased this past year with the pandemic, just because people are staying home. And I know a lot of private sector places are going to more work from home, but I feel like just giving people the option of not uh, driving every single day or commuting every single day would be a huge, um, a huge, uh, Im you know, improvement to for greenhouse gas emissions. I mean, I think that would be really huge. I don't know what else, because that's the majority of when people drive is every day on their way to work and back. So um, just giving people flexibility and options uh, so that they can choose not to do that if they, you know, don't have to or whatever. But, um, but uh, yeah, that would be actually that would be the biggest, the biggest one that and, and really improving, I would say winter maintenance here, that one and creating a policy so that we make sure all of the roadways and um, pathways are maintained in the winter so that you always knew if you wanted to walk somewhere, you could just step out your door and, and go. Um, that's my answer and I'm sticking to it. Great, thanks Joni. Um, and we are, it looks like now 15 or 13 minutes over, but I, I was given 15, so we'll wrap up here real shortly. Um, I wanted to end on an equity question. So I wanna just come to the chat. Um, limited English proficiency and non-white were listed as equity issues. How are you addressing this for community engagement? Um, one thing I'll add to this, um, this is a challenge, ongoing challenge I think um, every municipality faces um, that's really important to address. Uh, how we're beginning to address this issue is setting up the Anchorage Climate Equity Council. Um, it's an independent diverse leadership body composed of Anchorage residents who share a desire to tackle social justice issues. Um, the hope is, is for this independent body to um, keep us on to keep us honest in implementing the climate action plan in a really equitable way. Um, so the advisory committee is currently setting this up um, and is recruiting uh, individuals to make up this council and applying for grant funding. So that's very much in process. Um, with exactly 30 seconds left in my extra allotted time, um, Dick, I will hand it back to you. Okay. Well, thank you, Pierce. Thank you for moderating. Uh, thank you, Sean, Michelle, Joni, and Bart for a very interesting and informative discussion. Um, and I think it was fine to run over. We did lose a few people, but um, anyhow, it was a great discussion. Uh, missing from the Zoom event is the sound of the applause. So uh, everybody that's on the audience will give you a big hand. Thank, special thanks to Kari Gardy, who has been running the Zoom show this evening, along with Betsy Baker monitoring the chat and technical assistance from Katie Doherty and Stacia McGordy. The event has been organized by co-chairs Kari Gardy and Mary Lou Harrow, along with an awesome committee, including Peg Tylston and fantastic Common Ground Board members, Gretchen Nelson, Kemi Dalton, Betsy Baker, and Shara Sutherland. Thank you for your support and thank you for attending. If you're not a member of Alaska Common Ground, please go to our website at alaskacommonground.org to join or make a donation to Alaska Common Ground's work towards an engaged Alaska democracy. And remember to join us Thursday, March 25th, as we discuss how food systems can help us meet our climate action goals in Anchorage. Um, and with that, we'll close out. Please stay healthy, please stay engaged, and everybody, thank you for attending and have a good evening.